Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful day. It's been a beautiful weekend here in the southern United States. Has it been nice up there? Is it done snowing in that uh, northwest section? Yeah, it's gorgeous out here. Hmm, that's awesome. Yeah, it was actually um, warming up pretty good. It's uh, it it was really a beautiful day. It really was. Yeah. It's good you got to spend time with family this weekend. I went and saw my parents, and that was fun as well. Yeah. So, I see you're on the road. Ooh, I think yeah, we're uh, we're we're in uh, another state visiting family today. Hanging okay. out. Okay. Here I'm gonna cut to Kip's screen. Hey, Kip. Hey, how are hey, you guys? Kip. Very good. good. How so is you're, things you're going? Your car, huh? Yeah. Yeah, we're on, we're we're visiting family this weekend. <laughs> good. Yeah. How'd your how'd your uh, day go, Kip? Actually, it went really well. Um, uh, I'm I'm gonna ask y'all, uh, friends and family. Y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all, uh, <laughs> friends and family, please pray for my son. He has been struggling uh, for several years, uh, even before his dad died. Uh, he's really struggling now. And uh, he did come to church with us today. And there seemed to be, I mean, there are times I kind of peeked over at him. And uh, there was some, some breaking of that hard shell uh, around him. And uh, he needs the Lord so bad. And he's, he just needs to come home. He's my little prodigal right now. Um, other than that, I uh, saw my kids had a, had a picnic with them and, and it was great. So. Oh, it's, it is always, it is heartbreaking. Um, when it's one of your children that you're concerned about, it's, it's, it, and it's difficult to explain that to folks that, uh, don't have children, um, yeah. Hey, but if you've got a dog, they know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's yeah. funny how in a lot of uh, chats, that's the first thing people ask is, if I get raptured, is my dog coming with me? Because if they're not, I don't want to go. A lot of people are like that. My wife is like that with her horses. Yeah. Well, from my understanding, the animals that you love uh, do end up there at some point. Um I don't think they get raptured, but that's the, who knows. I don't know how that works, but um, I guess we'll find out hopefully soon. Yeah, we will. Yep. Yep. So what's up? You said you had uh, some things you wanted to touch on tonight, Kip. So well, being Easter Sunday, there's, there's a lot of, of little nuances to the Easter. I didn't want to call it Easter to the resurrection the cross, the resurrection, the, the story of the final days of Jesus on earth before his resurrection, that um, in the last couple of days, you know, sometimes you, you go back reading through your Bible and things pop out that you read four or five years ago that you underlined, that you wrote a note by that just slayed you then, but somehow it's faded into you know, the next thing or whatever. And all of a sudden it pops out at you again. And I spent like the last three days, maybe four days, bawling my eyes out, <laughs> reading, oh, no. reading scripture oh. and, and just coming to great grips with the final days of Jesus, you know, on earth and how, how perfect God's plan was, how every word, the time, um, even the Psalms, everything, every prophecy played into those final days so that we would believe, so that we would know without a shadow of a doubt that there's no way in the world that our God is not real because nobody could weave this all together. No human being could make all of this happen. That yeah. um, those things too? That movie mm -hmm. that I shared with everybody is so good it's about jesus and the, the last days it's the the gospel of john 
Um, it was that movie that kept randomly showing up on my TV. So eventually I sat down and watched it. Um, and it's a somewhat new cinema production, but wow, is it good. I mean, it, it essentially, it follows the book of John, uh, in chronological order, but in a cinema style. And mm -hmm. I was like, this is so, it really, you feel like you grow closer just by watching this movie because the actors that, that play the part, especially the one that plays Jesus, he does it so well with that overwhelming love. And it's, I, I, I usually don't uh, care for too many of those type of movies, but this mm -hmm. one very, it, it really hit home with me. Yeah. Well, there was one several years ago and I can't remember what the name of the actor was, but he had the really sunken cheeks and, and he would just look off into space. Yea, verily I say unto thee. I mean, that was the spooky Jesus. I was like, uh. Yeah, that was the one I couldn't, it didn't, it didn't affect me. I'm telling you that this one is on YouTube and it's an actual like three hour movie. Wow. I'm telling you, if you watch it, it will affect you. It, it, normally that stuff does not have any effect on me, but it kept popping up on my TV randomly. So I was like, all right, I need to watch this. But it really was. It, it's, I think I teared up at one point and I'm not a crier. It was a very, very well made. Um, and I loved how everything they talked about, they used it, like, it didn't sound like scripture, but all of their dialogue was following the scripture. So that's what was really unique about it is because the way John presents it is he tells that story. Mm -hmm. And the movie is laid out like that, again, without making it seem so, you know, rigid and scripture based. But everything is the scripture and how they're acting it out. I think that's what I really liked about it. Yeah. Um, it so it, it was it was really worth watching. Uh, I'll yeah. probably watch it again tonight when I'm done. Yeah, that's that's how I feel about the Passion of the Christ. Um, I Jim Caviezel is just amazing. He he's kind of an odd duck. Um, uh, he's good friends with one of my former pastors, and so he would come to our church and and uh, do um, you know uh, he he would give testimonies and stuff on Sunday. Um, every once in a while in Spokane, Washington. Thank you. Um, yeah. So uh, Life Center Church in Spokane, Washington. Pastor Joe Whitwer, he's just a crazy man. But uh, um, he's he's a different kind of a guy, but he got Jesus. And just the way he portrayed him with confidence and authority, yet such love and gentleness and kindness, it, it blew me away. It's not how anyone else that I'd ever seen in any movie, in any TV show, had portrayed Jesus. And, you know, it's kind of funny because Jesus's first uh, miracle was at a wedding. Mm -hmm. What was he doing at a wedding? With his mom. And it was he was a guest with um, his mom, Mary. It was part of their friends and their family. And the wine ran dry. Yes. And he wasn't ready to reveal himself yet. So he, the mother whispered to the, one of the servants and said, just do whatever he says. Mm -hmm. and, and those were the yeah. last words of Mary in the Bible. Do whatever he says. Is and it really? shouldn't we do the very same thing? Do whatever he says. He, she's speaking to us today. But here's the deal. Jesus was at a wedding because he was invited. People liked him. He yeah. was likable. And so many times they don't portray him like that in movies and it drives me crazy. I think that's what I liked about this movie. And someone asked what was the name of it. It's called The Gospel of John, The Story of Jesus Christ. Just go on YouTube and type in Gospel of John. You'll see it. It's a three-hour movie. It's brand new. But it, exactly. I, there's been things in the past that I've seen and it just did not sit well with me. So I could never watch it. But this one really, really resonated with me. His love, his compassion, his confidence. Yes. But the the non-judgmental non confidence that mm -hmm. um, in the one time 
Uh, it, you know, he shows his anger. It was controlled anger. It was when he went into the temple and they were had a farmer's market set up in the temple. <laughs> um, That's quite what that was. So, yeah. yeah the but th there was like, there was animals and money exchangers and all sorts of stuff in there. So that really yeah. set them off, but rightfully so. Hey, where'd Watchful go? Oh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I know that he's mobile and his uh, Wi-Fi was spotty. So... Okay. Let's... Well, you know, in the in the temple there, the the big problem was that it, you couldn't bring your own lamb, you couldn't bring your own turtle dove, you couldn't even use your own money to to give your tithe. You really? had to, your money. Is that why they had the animals and all that stuff? Yes, uh. because you had to buy them at an inflated price. So it's just, that just sounds dead. like the Catholic church. It just sounds like the church because that's how they did it. That's how they still do it. Yeah. Well, that's what the Catholics do, but I'm, I'm telling you, that's what the Jewish people were doing too. And so you couldn't pay your tithe to the temple with your shekel. You had to get a special temple shekel, which cost a shekel and a half or two shekels. And so they were ripping the people off, especially the poor especially the poor. That's why Jesus, I mean, he, he turned over the tables. He called them you den of thieves because they were stealing from the people. Uh, you know, yeah. They, they were, yeah, they were inflating everything. And then he let all those animals go that were going to be sacrificed. <laughs> he just let them go. And then the amazing thing was, you know, the, um, did he let go the turtle doves or did he leave the turtle doves? I can't remember which one it no, was. No, he, he, he freed all the animals. And he he sent them flying. The the little white birds. Yeah, little white birds, the turtle doves. And that was for the poor. And and he he warned them that that, that was one of the biggest sins is how they were ripping off the poor. Well, the it's funny because there was a decree um after that, and it's in the Jewish scriptures and Jewish history, that the price of turtle doves after this happened dropped. <laughs> you I know what's yeah, it's and what I found interesting by watching this movie is it really becomes clear on why they killed Jesus. It you know, for me that was kind of a gray area for a long time, but it's not anymore. What it was is the Pharisees were extremely intimidated and they talked amongst themselves and acknowledged that this was probably the son of God. But when everybody found out, they would destroy their church and disband everything they were doing because this was the real thing. And they mm -hmm. said they would rather kill one man than uh, allow um, you know, the rest of the community to come to the truth and they lose their church. That was what they were worried about is losing their church, losing their position. Yeah. And, and the big thing was he had said that he was going to, this. I'm going to tear this temple down. Yeah, he said that to them. And that it, scared them. We're going to tear down our temple? This is this is who took we us, are as a nation. And he said, it, yeah. it's, it, it took us 46 years to build this temple. You're going to rebuild it in one day? Yeah, in, in three days. They didn't realize he was talking about his body yet. Yeah. You know? So, but anyway... Um, I wanted to bring up a few things. I, I don't plan to be on here all night. I know you've got a lot of things that you guys wanted to talk about. Um, I really haven't given it any thought. I, just, you know, <laughs> I, I try to come on every night just to the talk and be with the community. That's it's kind of my thing. You know, there's new information that uh, almost every day, like mm -hmm. new information almost every like that. I titled this video based off of something that I learned today. I was studying the original Hebrew calendars and April 8th was the original resurrection day. And it ties in with that eclipse. Yeah. According to, I have to pull the, uh, I, I put the data in the description. I'll send you yeah. the calendar and I'll send you a few of the videos that I was using, but um, because the, the calendars in the later years, especially the ones that we're on right now, um, mm -hmm. they're not the right calendars. So no. it's, it's, it was the, the data, one. 
And, and the other reason I, I bring that up is because, holy moly, something else that's attached to that date. Yeah. A big eclipse, that's for sure. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so, I mean, I mean, really, holy moly. Just, who, who knows? There are there are people like uh, our friend Craig Mong. He believes that the calendar is off by as, as much as two months. Yeah. So, yeah. But uh, one of the things, you know, the Garden of Gethsemane, Geth Gethsemane, sorry there, Gethsemane. After Jesus finished his prayer, now this is, this is John 18. After Jesus finished his prayer, he left his disciples and went across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden. Judas the traitor knew where this place was, for Jesus had gone there often with his disciples. Yeah. Well, this place, the Kidron Ravine, is the exact path that David took when he was forced to flee from the traitorous Absalom, his son. Yeah. And where is you know, Jesus going? He's going to the same place where he will be, be uh, betrayed. Just like David was being betrayed. And, he, and he's very, Jesus was very pleased to be called the son of David. And that just blows people away to this day. The son of, you're God. The son, no, he, he loved David. As a matter of fact, read Psalms 22. David saw the cross. He, I, I believe he went through time and saw the cross and then wrote about it. That's, that's what I personally believe. Can I prove it? No. But the, the imagery is too perfect for him not to have. And well, he so could have had a, a vision. He could have. He could have. But mostly what David wrote, and it doesn't say that it's a vision, doesn't say that it's a dream. Mostly what David wrote about was his own life. And a lot of this stuff does not fit with it. But, but I, I really believe that he saw through space and time. You know, here's, here's a really interesting thing about the Mount of Transfiguration that we, I think we might have brought this up once or twice before. Um, but the exact place where Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, and I can't remember the name of the mountain, Horeb, might have been Horeb, um, was the exact same place that Moses was when God passed by him. You know, there was the there was the the thunder and God passed by. He put him in the cleft of the rock. He said, I will pass by you and show you my goodness. That's where Moses was. Guess what? That's the exact spot where Elijah was when Elijah was hidden in the cleft of the rock. And and the earthquake went by and the fire went by. And then the still small voice spoke to him. They were all three in the same place. 400 and 800 years apart. And then they all show up. And then those are the three people at the transfiguration. Did Was there a rip in space and time? So that hmm. these people on, you know, on the, in the same spot came together for a conversation. That's quite a question that very well might have happened. So, you know, who knows? David could have time traveled. They could have time traveled. Um, yeah, that's that is an interesting thought. But uh, this Kidron Valley, that's where David went to save himself. And that's where Jesus went to give himself up. And then Gethsemane literally means olive press. That's where they used to press all the olives and take them and squish them down to make olive oil for their lamps and for everything else. My goodness, everything they used olive oil for. Um, but yeah, so just as Adam fell in a garden, that's where Adam fell. This is where Jesus went to stand for us and he stood faithful in that garden for us. So yeah. I thought that was pretty cool. I thought that was uh, pretty cool. Let me pause for a second. Hey, Frank, look, uh, I know that you, you mean well and what you're trying to say, but your debate point is not even relevant to what we're talking about right now. You know, the chat is there for everybody to fellowship and love each other. But when you're talking about a totally different uh, talking point and debating with folks in the chat and then getting engaged with them, we might as well not even be talking because now the distraction is in, you know, it's in pretty much full effect. So you're always welcome 
But come on, man. It, it's clear that folks are having an issue with this because everybody's addressing you as Frank. Listen, Frank, this. Um, yeah, I'm trying to be nice about it, brother. Anyways. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. No, I totally get it. I totally get it. And then, you know, I, the other part that kill, killed me is, you know, my son sent me this, this clip of a song and it, I don't know if it's actually been released. It was just a little clip of it. And it was a song called I am Barabbas. And it's a new song by a really, really? A young, Oh my gosh. I'm telling you what, huh? It wasn't even the whole song. And I, I just stood there going, I'm Barabbas. I'm Barabbas. You know, sometimes we don't even think of that. We think of him as this other character, this person in the Bible, and he runs through the pages of scripture, but he's us. Every one of us is Barabbas. And you know what? Barabbas in Aramaic means son of the father. Bar yeah. is son of, and Abba is father, son of the father. He hmm. was and what was Jesus? He was the son of the father. Yeah. What a detail for our God to put in, in scripture for us to know. Yeah. That, that um... this man was also, so he becomes a picture of the, of every son of man. You know, some people believe it's a figure of speech, but his name does actually mean son of the father. That's and so, yeah, he's a picture of every one of us. So, and that leather strap that they, that whip with all the, the pieces of glass and metal on it, that was called the scorpion. So, hey. yeah, that's exactly ask, what I called it. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, do you think that every person on this planet has heard about Jesus yet? Well... This is my understanding of scripture. And some people would say, this is my doctrine. And, but this is my, under <laughs> I'm going to say my understanding of scripture rather than my doctrine. Cause my doctrine is kind of like what a bully would say. So, um, uh, my understanding of scripture that is that in revelation, there are 144,000 set aside. And what is their job? Their job is to witness. We have two witnesses, possibly two whole churches. What is their job? To witness. Well, okay. what, then where the great angel that comes through, and what is his job? To witness. I, I, from my understanding of scripture, that's when everybody has heard. Yeah. So uh, I've been studying this section, and it, and it seems like if in the 69th week before. It moves into the seventieth week of uh, week of Daniel, uh, Jacob's trouble, I, mm -hmm. I believe, is what it's called. There is a period of grace that A is designed to fool Satan because Satan is unaware uh, of you know what is waiting on because he can't he doesn't know everything he knows a lot, but not only that. It won't move into that next time period unless every soul is at least heard of Jesus. And apparently this week there has been reports that they think that everybody, every soul on the planet has at least heard of Jesus. So it, it was just interesting. I don't know if this is true, but it, it made sense. And according to the scripture, it kind of lined up as well. But I was just, I was wondering, do you think that really all four corners of the globe has heard of him. Is there some random tribe in South America in the Amazon that's, that still hasn't heard about him or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. I do know that God put the stars in place to tell a story so that man would be without excuse. And when he says, I mean, this is at the beginning of the Bible. So when he says, so that man would be without excuse, he's talking about all men for all time in all places. So we should be able to look up and know, wow, there is a creator. Do we know that it does, do they have to know the name of Jesus? I'm not sure, but, but they should know that there's a God in heaven. That's for certain. So, so yeah, so, so that would be without excuse because the Bible is written in the stars. 
Yeah, uh, the 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 what is it called? The Torah. Did I get that right? Yeah. I the uh, well in the in the, first the six books. In the twelve signs in the twelve signs. There, the the gospel is written from the from the Virgin Mary, from the Virgin being with child to the price need needing to be paid by the scales of Libra, and then there's mm -hmm. an enemy who needs to be dealt with, which is Scorpio the Scorpion. You know, and so if you if you go through it, and and I can I can talk about that another day. I've I've got my book not too far away from me, but I didn't think about it. Uh, talk <laughs> so. About it. But the 12 constellations tell the story of, of the fall of mankind all the way to the redemption of, of the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lion, Leo, coming back and, and taking care of business. Yeah, that's just so awesome. See, that's, that's no. no one can fabricate that. These are, for folks that are lukewarm and on the fence, there's things that are now being revealed that is extremely compelling though so one thing that makes me think that all four corners of the globe have have heard of his name is that it appears that israel is now finally being turned on by the united states yeah. and this mm. is a very 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 key component to prophecy this this marks a shift in gears. This is um, this is a very key component, and to for folks that don't understand what happened, is in a recent UN vote, for the very first time, America abstained from voting. They have always voted for Israel. This time, and they could have made a difference. It was the one vote that it was would have vetoed the vote or you understand what I'm saying? They, uh, yeah. Biden abstained. So it is now moving on to the next step where I believe right around April 8th, they're going to vote on the two step solution. And if the United States abstains again, it's going to get interesting because Israel is not going to willfully give up half of Israel. Well, and I don't even know how successful that can be. I mean, the UN makes all kinds of votes and never enforces them. And so I would I would be surprised if Israel would allow the enforcement of this. That, well, they're not going to. They get censured all the time. I, there's yeah. always stuff like that. And Israel just keeps on trucking. They just ignore them. So I, I would be interested to see how this one plays out. I really well, do. no, you, you're you're right. Israel just gives them the bird. I get that, but <laughs> Love it. this is what we've done. This is, is what is different is that the U.S. has always had Israel's back all through the last 60, 70 years, or however long it's been since the nineteen forty eight. Um, 70, solution 70. that however long 70. that is so this is something that's new and this has never happened and you're right um, Netanyahu's going to be like whatever but at this point this is when Bible prophecy fulfills because yeah. now all the nations are against them that's yeah. the kind of the, the that's kind of the point the the United States and his and their allies were the key component and supporter of Israel. Uh, they were completely surrounded by their enemies. And everybody else, or pretty much around the world, was, you know, either hot or cold. They were just, they were like, whatever. But the United States was their backing, providing weapons, and always voted in their favor. But mm -hmm. now, it's, it's almost an insult that they abstain from the vote. Yeah. That's oh, it is. It is an insult. <laughs> so, uh, so it, and it gets even better because Biden has um, our administration and the UN and King Charles have said that they're going to send in a multinational force to help with the transition of this two-state solution. But get this: 
they said it will be Palestinian uh, ran authority. Yeah. So how's that a multinational when the folks that truly hate the other folks are nothing is going to have changed except well, you're just going to get more war. What does King Charles have to do with any of this? He's not a member of the UN. He doesn't have a seat there. Why is he even deciding what happens in any way, shape or form? He's been the one negotiating the, or at least trying to negotiate the peace process with Netanyahu, but it's not going well. Ding, 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 ding. Um, his I'm son, <laughs> his son has also been involved as well. Yeah. Um, but here's the thing. It, I don't see any type of peace agreement yet. There's a lot of friction over there. So until there's that uh, agreement, because we know that has to happen. Because, but we don't know that it's a peace agreement. It just says, yeah, you're, you're right. with many. There's like four or five different seven year covenants that are already in play. Yeah, from 2020, the Abraham Accords. Yeah. There's Abraham Accords. There's all kinds of the the uh, COP Accords. I mean, there's there's crazy stuff that's already in play. And so I think what we're just waiting on is this Ezekiel 38 war, where the hook in the jaw to Gog of Magog from the north pulls him down with Syria, Turkey, and and Iran, and they come against Israel, and God fights for Israel. And God himself well, eats them. That's that's really the next thing on the timeline. We haven't seen that happen yet, but I'm telling you what, there's some hooks in Putin's jaw. Uh, well, like where somebody went and shot up all these people, uh, terrorist attacks. I mean, there's all kinds of hooks in Putin's jaw. Well, that's a whole nother topic of conversation. The, yeah. the, the, what happened uh, in that, and that guy's country, um, I truly believe, and I've seen some. Did you watch that thing from the Steve Contalati that the uh, Chickalani? Yeah. Did you see Chikulani. what he said about the CIA and what happened over there, um, and how uh, John John Kirby three weeks beforehand announced what was going to happen, and then it happened. Yep. He three weeks before that incident in Moscow. Um, our Secretary of Defense, or whatever his name is, went on White House record telling all Americans stay away from shopping malls, concerts, and public gatherings. He actually said concerts, concerts. first. And then, and, and, uh, oh, and shopping and... <laughs> oh uh, S- Steve made some very, very compelling points because the the people that went in and did that assault, the folks that normally represent ISIS are very outspoken about it. They don't hide their face. They will scream Allah Akbar the whole time. God is great. Do any of that. And will quickly martyr themselves. They won't hide. They're good with dying because they, you know, their belief is they go straight to 99 virgins in heaven. So that's just their doctrine. This was not the case. All of these, um, assailants that didn't fit the description and they hid and then when in interview they explained that an anonymous um, agent on telegram arranged all this and you know agreed to pay them like a, a really horrible amount like five thousand to do this yeah, five five thousand bucks is what it was but this was definitely, definitely not ISIS. No. This has all the hallmarks of our three-letter agency baiting the leader of that country into war. Yeah. That's what they want. They want that instability. They know their next step and next plans cannot move mm-hmm. forth Unless there is mad chaos, because no one is going to agree to their shenanigans right now. It needs to be completely a desperate position for them to present what they're going to present 
folks will be so sick and tired of the chaos. They'll be like, whatever. Give me any sense of normalcy. I'll agree to whatever. But right now, that's not going to happen. So yeah. they have to have war. It's 100% in the cards. Well, because and it makes money and it gives them power. But you, you said it when you said that they were baiting the big bear. That's mm -hmm. in the jaw. You know, he doesn't have to be. And everybody's like, everybody's always believed that this, that Gog of Magog is this evil, evil person. Yeah, he doesn't have to be. He doesn't have to be an evil, evil person to be the person that God uses to get something done. Frank, right now. Are you, Frank, are you still debating? Are you guys still debating in the chat? Um, come on, Frank. I understand that you mean well, but <laughs> I don't get it. Um. Yeah, I'll, I'll shut up. It just, it doesn't make any sense to me why we debate in the chat over something that we're not even talking about on the show. Um, anyways, mm -hmm. sorry, Kip. Yeah. So anyway, um, so the hook in the jaw, that's, that's definitely guys, it's, it's happening in front of our eyes. It's, that's exactly what's happening with all these shenanigans. Um, so yeah, so I, I would think that we are, on the doorstep of that Ezekiel 38 war that is very specific. And when we see that, oh boy, <laughs> it's on like Donkey Kong and there's there's no going back. The time is just literally ticking faster than we know. So, yeah. yeah. Hey, speaking of baiting, uh, our current administration is attempting to do this. As everybody knows, they passed something renaming Easter this weekend. Everybody knows this. We know it's an insult. But mind you, they did this for a reason. And this is a bait. They are looking for a violent response. And everybody has to understand that this is a bait. And the reason I said that, that two to three weeks prior, they formed a new division in their special three-letter agency that gives them the authority to identify specific groups and people as an international or a domestic threat, and they can disarm these groups or individual people without having to have cause. They can disarm them and remove them their rights as a Second Amendment. This yeah. I 100% believe in, in my heart that they are baiting they it, it wouldn't make any sense otherwise because the popularity just you know all he's doing is shooting himself in the foot but it's very convenient that just a few weeks ago he went on tv and announced this new policy and he addressed the uh the red hat people you know the previous administration's uh, followers he addressed them directly as being the target of needing this new uh, law for being able to disarm certain dangerous extremists. I'm 100%, I'm just telling you guys, what they did about Easter and renaming it to that, you know, that day, it's a bait. And unfortunately, I think there's going to be people that are going to respond that, that uh, are not going to use some common sense and it will just simply justify what he is doing. And he'll say, look, I told you so. And that will be just the first step to disarming everybody else. It's a, I, I, you know, every day I see what's going on and I can't believe that this is reality. I'm sure everybody on this show remembers 2018 and 2019 very clearly. We are not in the same it, you. There's such a drastic difference. I mean, holy moly. It's um it doesn't matter what side of the fence you fall on as far as politically. I don't care about that. But what I care about is the quality of life for my family, the cost of goods, mm -hmm. um, just the you know, just some basic fundamentals. There has been a drastic shift. A drastic shift. And I would love to hear anybody's argument that says otherwise. I mean, <laughs> no, seriously. Well, you're, you're because Biden's. there's a lot of people. <laughs> you're Biden's. 
<laughs> None of it makes any sense either. I mean, you have to lie. You have to lie. I and mean, this, this weekend, he, or is it this week or this week weekend, uh, him, the, him, the current administration and the administration before the last administration, and then uh, the administration before that. So those three old dudes had a big um, fundraiser and they had a packed house. People are cheering for them like they're rock stars. Yeah. They, they brought get $24 it. million dollars for Biden's war chest. $24 million. Dollars. Where was President Trump during all this? Was he at possibly a wake for a murdered... Police New officer? York, yeah, New York City police officer. Is that where he possibly was? Yes. And That's our where current he... administration didn't even call that lady. Yep. Yep. It's it's despicable. It is absolutely despicable. But here's the deal. I'm going to, I, I want to pop in here and finish what I was, I was t telling you guys about Resurrection Day. And, and how amazing our God is. There's two more things I wanted to just throw out there to you that, you know, uh, they just tend to float away and then all of a sudden it's brought back. So you know how Pontius Pilate wrote above Jesus's head, Jesus, King of the Jews, right? So um, the Jewish language reads right to left, not left to right. The words, the actual words that were up there. Now we see this translation, Jesus, King of the Jews, and we don't, and we just go right past it. It means nothing to us. But let me tell you, it meant everything to those Pharisees. They were furious and the people were stunned at what was up above Jesus's head. And in Aramaic, it said, Yeshua Hanoz, Hanozrai Wumelech a Yehudim. So the, the first letter of each word going from right to left, sorry guys, is Y-H-W-H. That's what they would have seen in capital letters, Y-H-W-H, -H, Yahweh. The sacred hmm. name of God was above his head and they were furious. So Pontius Pilate, who knew nothing of who Jesus was, and I, I don't know. I, I feel like the poor guy was caught in the middle. I don't know how evil he was. Um, documents have come out to show that he was, he didn't have as many Roman soldiers in, in Jerusalem as we think he had, and that he felt he had to give them their, their way because if there was an actual insurrection, he would not have been able to quell it. He just did not have enough people there, enough Roman centurions. So uh, he claimed to have one centurion and a cohort in Jerusalem. And that was in a letter. Gosh, I just read it the other day. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. But anyway, so, so the words that Pilate wrote over Jesus actually called him Yahweh, called him God Almighty. And then something that's always really gotten me is, during the sacrifice, during the time of the sacrifice of the Passover, there are very specific rituals and songs that happen. And as Jesus was on the cross, the people and the priests in the temple, everybody would have been singing specific songs, saying specific things. So what is that? It's called the Hallel. And it is Psalms 113 through 118. And he very likely could have been able to hear these songs being sung because of the way that everything was was on different levels that those songs could have come out and actually gotten to Golgotha to hear them so it was Psalms 113 through 118 and what is Psalms 118 and you know it's funny because I found I found the greatest video um, of, of Jewish people in front of the wailing wall and it was from like two or three years ago something like that and they are singing the hallel 
and worshiping. And the Psalms 113 and Psalms 114 are, I mean, they're dancing, they're singing, la, 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 la. They're just going for it. And then it gets really solemn. And by the time they get to one Psalms 118, it says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his love endures forever. And what is Jesus doing? He's pouring out his love one bloody drop at a time. In my anguish, I cried to the Lord. Now, guys, read this not as David. Let's, let's read this from the point of view of Jesus. In my anguish, I cried to the Lord, and he answered me, setting me free. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I will look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in, in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All the nations surrounded me. But in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me on every side. But in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They swarmed around me like bees, but they died out as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. Well, that happened. <laughs> the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Shouts of the Lord. The victory resounds in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I did not die, but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. I mean, this is a Psalm that David wrote. And, and if you read it from Jesus on the throne, I will not die, but live. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely on our behalf, but he has not given me over to death. Open me Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. How many times did Jesus say, I am the door? I am, and he even said he is the, the gate to the sheepfold. What, was there a gate, an actual like metal or wooden gate on a sheepfold? No. The shepherd put himself in the opening. That's what shepherds do. They sit in the opening. They, they block it with their body and with their, their staff. So that's, that's what the gate is. It's actually the shepherd's body. So when he says, I am the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter, I will give you thanks for you answered. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in his eyes. There's a little bit more, but that's the that's the gist of it. You know that how awesome. how in the world this is the song that is singing as he dies. As he is dying, they are literally singing, the stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone, has become the chief cornerstone. Hmm. I tell you, what I have really been struggling with, and one of the uh, members on one of the social sites was like that I keep going back and forth. I'm not sure if it's necessarily going back and forth. I really I share the information as I get it to let you know what I'm considering. The whole rapture topic is something that I don't understand why my mind cannot settle on one thing. Uh, as far as so many other things, when it comes to scripture and Christ, it's so clear and my discernment tells me so clearly the answer. So many things that many other folks are, you know, on the fence or don't believe or something about. It's extremely clear to me the answer. But when it comes to this, I, it's, I really struggle with the definitive answer. You know, there's... Yeah. So many people that are just like completely mentally hell bent on there is no rapture. The second coming is that. And then you have folks like Dr. Thrapp that's like, well, look, I know for a fact it's going to be, you know, the year before the end of whatever. And then there's a whole slew of people that are 
really big pre-tribbers. And this is not a salvation issue. It's just something that, you know, I like to try to understand. And I, I heard something today that was talking about the, the apostasy, the apostasy, uh, ap the ap ap apost apostasy. Um, and in Second, Th Second Thessalonians, the, the apostasy has to happen before the lawless one arrives. So essentially this has to happen before, you know, the great tribulation pretty much kicks in gear. And I think uh, all the pre-tribbers, this is one of their foundation anchors for their, their, you know, their belief. Well, but and that's, that's the whole point. The, the apostasy started 40 years ago. People have been falling away from the church and leaving the church. And the church has become, the church is supposed to be a battleship. We are supposed to be fighters. Jesus said, occupy until I come. Occupying does not mean, okay, we've got this, this area and we're going to stay here and we're just going to guard our area. When you occupy a, a nation, you advance, you, you take things over. Um, that's what we were supposed well, to do, we're supposed to advance. But we haven't. We have turned our, ship, our, our battleships into cruise ships. And so, you know, we talk all the time about lukewarm Christians. That's an apostasy. Well, this and wasn't I'll where I was going with that. The, what, where yeah. I was going with that is the original um, in Greek, it, 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 it gives a different, it paints a different picture when you read it in context. It literally paints a picture that the church is taken up. You know, and mm -hmm. I'd recommend folks that it has access to the Hebrew Greek translation. So this is where I've been struggling and said that I'm on the fence because I have made up my mind on this. This is just something that I've been on the fence about for a long time. And when new data appears to me, it's not that I'm going back and forth. I share this information with everybody. So I'm sure that there's many folks that they gather new information and they go back and forth in their, in their mind about it, but they don't share it publicly. Uh, I'm, I'm a public guy, so I share these debates that I have with myself mentally with the public. So uh, for some, don't take it as me going back and forth. It's, I'm really, it's something I'm trying to figure out on my own. Um, you know, I'm sure that there's a topic for many people in life that they've struggled to identify the correct answer or even an answer at all. And this has been one of those things that I have struggled to come up with a concrete answer on because of supporting evidence on both sides. But what I read today kind of changes that in my eyes because of the original context in Greek of the apostasy that says point blank that this has to happen before the man of lawlessness, you know, steps up on the stage. Okay. And then, so you're saying that the word apostasy does not mean falling away. It could, but it, uh, what I'm saying is, is in the original context, if you read what it is in Greek, if you want to look that up, it paints a different picture as uh, being taken away. What what scripture is it? I did a quick uh, second, second Thessalonians. Uh, I just closed my Bible. Um, I'll pull back up in a second. <laughs> but what I found interesting is that if I consider that as part of the the root anchor of my argument for that, then the next thing that makes sense in my mind is that when they talk about the restrainer being pulled. And pretty much all hell breaks loose. <laughs> that restrainer would be the church that was taken away in the apostasy. So that's what I have always, that is what I have always been taught. That is what I have always seen in scripture is that the restrainer is the church. A lot of people say it's the Holy Spirit, but hey, where's the Holy Spirit live? In us, right? So if the church is the restrainer, you know, because we're filled with the Holy Spirit and we're keeping this all at bay. If we are taken up now, that doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit leaves the earth. He's still got work to do. He promised never to leave us nor forsake us. 
And even the people that are left behind, he's not going to leave nor forsake them until the very last breath. So are don't think sure? the Holy Spirit is going to leave these people that are left behind with no, w without the Holy Spirit, you can't get saved. The, the Bible says that. And we know mm, that there's okay. that people get saved in the tribulation. Yeah. You can't be saved without the work of the Holy Spirit. So he has to still be on earth. But he's still in us in heaven. He's he's not limited. Well, he's 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 everywhere. Um, so, and so I I went to continue thinking about this, and then a next piece of supporting argument for this was when all hell breaks loose. It only makes sense is because the church has been taken away. The influence of prayer by the masses is no longer present. Because it, it, it's clear that this is going to be an extraordinary period. And then the next thing that I think about is that I can't see the children being put through this. I, I can't see it. I don't want to see it. <laughs> I'm like, please, Lord, even if you leave the rest of us, take the children. Please take the children. But, you know, throughout the centuries, God didn't remove the children from things that happened. And I just looked at apostas the apostasy in the Greek out of um, uh, First Thessalonians, uh, Second, Second Thessalonians 2, 3. And it is the word defection or revolt. Now, defection, hey, we defect. Please let us defect from this world up into heaven. I like that idea. Um, but yeah, it's the word defection or revolt, according hmm. to Bible Hub and, and the Greek lexicon. Hmm. Let me let me click on this and see. Bum, 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 bum. Um, it it goes. It's in Acts 21, 21, and it is the words to forsake or apostasy and falling away or apostasy. So um, defection or revolt. I don't see it. I don't see it actually used as defection or revolt. Hmm. So just as being forsaken or falling away. So I'm going uh, to send if, you. I'm gonna sorry. I'm gonna send you something for you to to digest when we when we get off, and then uh, I I'll really look to hear your your thoughts on what I send you because it's you know it takes a lot now for me to reconsider something because I've essentially heard it all, but this really had me scratching my head. So, nevertheless, well, you know it's it's funny because yes, the black and white of scripture is really important. And, and that is all I knew for years and years and years. And then I went to a very prophetic church and I was really challenged that a lot of times, especially the Bible was not written to 21st century Gentiles in America. It was not written to us. Is it still applicable? Yes but it was written to first century Jews. That's who it was written to. And there's a lot of history. There's a lot of, of uh, cultural things that we don't understand. Like, like the way that their, their alphabet goes backwards and they read backwards. And so the words that, that Pilate put above Jesus's head would have spelled out Yahweh. Hmm. You know, we, we miss that. We totally miss that because it's not, it's not in our culture. Well, there's the Galilean wedding feast, which is very specific. It's not like a, a typical Jewish wedding feast. It is a Galilean wedding feast. And Jesus was a Galilean. And so he speaks about and, and drops these little hints all the way through scripture that refer back to a Galilean wedding feast. Uh, his very, very first miracle was where at, a, at wedding. a wedding at a wedding and so there's all these things that he says and all of these let me see if i can find it here i, don't, I, I won't do the go through the whole thing but 
Oh, dum dum dum. Well, oh. I guess the, the 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 reality of it is, I I think we are going to find out very soon, <laughs> one way or the other. This question yeah. will be, it's going to be answered. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a lot of stuff that Jesus said, like in my father's house, there are many mansions. Right. Uh, go, you know, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Okay. Right. Um, that is wedding language. When he. It, no, I, I, I get it. But that yeah. all, uh, so all that stuff can. The prophetic picture of the rapture of the church through these little hints that he drops all the way through scripture from the last supper, when he told his, his disciples that he was not going to drink this cup until he drank it with them again in heaven. Why, why did he say that? Because this is a marriage cup. This means that, that it, it's. No, it's I, I get it. I believe that at some point, I believe at some point that it happens, of course. It's just the timing of it I'm trying to sort out in my head. That's all. Yeah. You know, it's well, it's and the timing of it for me, honestly, through that prophetic picture of, of the wedding feast is a pre tribulation rapture. That he goes and he gets his bride, he goes into the he, he takes him back to the father's house for a seven day, seven year wedding feast and closes the door in a Galilean wedding feast. If you're not inside the courtyard, when they shut the door, nobody in, nobody out. You, you don't, you don't leave. Nobody gets in. Well, what mm. do we know from scripture? People are knocking at the door saying, wait, wait, we did all this stuff for you. Let us in. We prophesied in your name. We did this. And he said, I, I never knew you. I never yeah. knew you. So, so we know that when all the bad stuff starts to happen, <laughs> The, the the door is shut and the bride is is safe. <laughs> that, that is where I always lay. Now, could that even be a mid tribulation rapture? Depending, you know, it it could be, it could because the great tribulation is literally hell on earth. Holy cow! It is sheer destruction, millions of people dying. Um, so. And, and I think I, I taught on it once back a couple months ago uh, and went through all the scriptures. But, but God is very specific. I mean, Jesus gave parables about a wedding feast, the father sending out invitations to his son's wedding. And people, these people that you think would go, oh, my gosh, yes, go, oh, well, I'm busy. I'm busy. It gives three different kinds of people who say that they're busy. And when it gets right down to it, it's it's the greedy, the religious and the lawful, you know, people who are legalistic, people who are ultra religious and people who are all about money are the people that turn him down. And so so he sends out um, messengers to bring in just the regular people off the side of the road, just can you come in? Can you come in? Can you come in? And so we all get this invitation, but we have to say yes. We have to say yes to well, be that's, there. That's well said. The, the legalistic folks, I think, get under my skin the most. Me I too. Would rather, I, I would rather someone just reject it without, you know, just, but the legalistic folks, and I won't name any names, Mm -hmm. And we've had to put people in time out for this. Yeah. The legalistic folks can drive more away from Christ than the folks that tell them they don't believe. Because creating that apprehension and that confusion and that doubt of the truth is a massive, massive uh, barrier that you throw in the path. And some people cannot get past that barrier that you have casted in front of them. So folks that are legalistic, you have to understand that sometimes you are doing some damaging work, damaging, well, like horrible just stuff. Watchful. You know, watchful is brilliant and he loves the Lord. And but he still has to fight off the legalism and the religious spirit that beat him down to the point where he just didn't even know what was going on. Oh, yeah. And he still struggles with that. And, and the man is brilliant and he loves the Lord, but, but legalism 
has has wounded him and yeah, and no, the Lord sure. heal. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's no, you're yeah, right. Because me and, there's times me and him while on the air will start getting snippy with each other because of a legalistic type position and uh but you're right but nevertheless it, your point is extremely yeah. valid he's he's a wonderful person and a, and a a true follower of christ in his core but because he's been deceived and lied to so many times by the church it it's like someone that's bit by a dog they can't help to react a certain way when they're around a dog you know mm -hmm. it's they've been wounded so i have yeah. to always keep that in mind you know that's one thing we don't sit here and say i'm right i'm right i'm right my doctrine says i'm right we say in, in my understanding and we debate back and forth and we listen to one another um people who won't listen to anybody else uh, i don't listen to them i don't give them the time of day if if you can't talk about this or or if you can't consider that there's more to that scripture then i i don't have time for that if you can't well, consider more to it the the first red flag for me is someone that is not humble yeah and as soon as someone leads with pride i am done the it's true. I mean, that was what got Satan cast out of heaven was his pride. Well, pride is, is the was, opposite that was of Peter's fall. Peter's fall was pride. You know, he said, I will never, I will never, I will never, mm -mm, I would go to death for you. And, and of course he eventually did, but he did exactly what the Lord told him he was going to do. And he, he said, no, I won't. No, I won't. He was so puffed up with pride at being a leader, at being the rock, that he denied Jesus three times. And what was the sign of that? The, co the crow. The cock okay. will crow or something like that. And what is, what is related to the cock, the cock of the walk, the crooster? Uh. I mean, it's... It's the symbol of pride. The symbol oh, that's of pride. interesting. I never made that connection. It's a symbol of pride. Yeah. Um, uh, it's in, in dreams and stuff. Well, you know, just even in culture, when you think of the, the big red cock of the walk, it's all about pride. Yeah. So I called him out. Yeah. And so I, I only mentioned this because this is, is really important. If, if, you know who you are if you struggle with this legalistic um, take on things. It's, 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 you don't want to be in that position. That is something that at some point God will humble those prideful folks. Mm -hmm. And you would rather just be humble on your own uh -huh. than to be humbled by the Lord. Yes. Because I've been humbled by the Lord. <laughs> Me too. I have <laughs> been humbled by the Lord several mm -hmm. times. It took several years. I went through most of my life being puffed up with pride. And I was humbled several, several times. But once you finally wrap your head around how it's really supposed to be. And for in my eyes, it's, you know, I want to be like Jesus. I want to talk the way he talks, how he loves and is compassionate, how he's non judgmental, how he is humble without pride. You know, there was times that Jesus did have to get upset and he did have to go scorched earth, but that wasn't often. There was a specific reason, but he led with love with everything that he did. Everything was founded in love and patience. And so that's what my goal is every day when I wake up is to be like him. Yeah. And, if, and, and honestly, one of the most humble people I know is watchful. He is oh, he so, very humble. So unbelievably humble. I am, I am always floored. I am always floored and I'm just like, ah, okay. Um, you've convicted me without even knowing it because of your, 
your absolute humility. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Awesome. Well, I know you couldn't stay long. I'll probably wrap it up too. I just wanted to come on and spend a little time with the community and, um, you know, make a few points. Um, yeah. And as but... far as the rapper goes, I, you know, I have always been so solidly pre. But it's really hard right now with people yelling, there isn't one, there isn't one, which is just, you know, and, and the bottom line is we're all here until we're gone. And yeah. please do not make the mistake, the ugly, prideful mistake of looking at someone who believes in the pre-tribulation rapture and saying, well, I hope, I, you know, well, what's going to happen when it doesn't happen? You're, you have, you don't have any faith because you want to get out of here. It's not about wanting to get out of here. It's not about uh, escaping or anything like that. Um, it's, it's our hope. It is a hope. It's and a it's blessed hope. hope. Yeah. And it's what we see in scripture. This is how we, we look at it. This is what we see. And we might see things that you don't, Right. but, but please, do not be so unloving as to tell me that I don't have any faith and that all I want to do is get out of here and that I've been sitting on my blessed assurance the <laughs> whole time and and I just want to leave. No, I I'm on this show. The other was it yeah, it was last night. Last night I spent 2 hours talking to my son's roommate about the Lord. Because he's he's looking at the headlines and he's going, what is happening? And I'm taking him through <laughs> all of this stuff and how it's all in the Bible. This ancient book tells the future. It tells the future and it's right you on. Yeah, you literally have the playbook uh, in your hands. It is. And, and, and so don't tell me that I lack faith. Don't tell me that I'm not doing anything for Jesus because I I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture and don't tell me that if if it doesn't happen i am going to fall apart that my faith is so flimsy and so so surfaced that i am going to quit believing please that is so unloving and so rude and that's those are the kind of things i see in our comments when somebody brings up the pre-tribulation rapture uh, and and I, really I always it's it's really almost any comment when you have that legalistic approach. Yeah. I see so many that if someone else does not agree with their perspective, they go straight to saying their doctrine and <sighs> are and are condescending and defensive. You know, we're all here to live and learn and love together. And uh, my position on the rapture may not be clear, but it's only because I'm, I'm learning. And it's something that I've struggled to identify which way. Do I hope that it happens? Yes. If it doesn't, okay, great. But there's no reason to be condescending toward someone either way because I see it on both sides. Some people are, you know, are condescending. If you don't believe it, so, you know, being legalistic is not the way. It's, you know, we all hope for the best. And love is the answer. If it does happen, great, we're out of here. But if not, we still live every day the same as it may happen tomorrow. Because, you know, the reality of it is no, the next day is not promised to anybody. So... Yeah. There you have it. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know what? Dis agree to disagree. Uh, that's okay. We don't all have to believe the same. Our, our, our information, you know, is not the same. Our background is not the same. So, you know, let's, let's just love one another. That's a lot of stuff that is not a salvation issue. There's yeah, a lot of things but... that aren't a salvation issue. You're saved. I'm saved. If we're going to fight about this kind of stuff, we are literally going against the last prayer of Jesus to his father, which was make them one as I am one. He wanted yeah. us to have unity. And when we're tearing one another down and we're fighting over who's smartest and who knows more and who's right, um, we are not in unity. There's, there's no time for us to be fighting amongst ourselves when we're supposed to be out fighting an enemy. Yeah, I mean, that's just Satan working in the bunch. 
Well, cool, man. It was so good having you. Hey, we are live in the morning with Dr. Sean. Dr. Sean has a really incredible guest. He has a an, an NDE guest. It's going to be really interesting. I'm excited to to hear Dr. Sean. It's it's always a pleasure listening to him. He is just you know, I've known him my whole life and I've often wondered, is he an angel? Cuz he ha- he has that such a compassionate, non-judgmental just but uh he has this aura that I cannot explain. I've known him. He's he, I've known him my whole life. There's pictures of me, him holding me, and I'm in diapers. And it's how old is, is Sean? Um, sixty-five. No. <laughs> oh no, no, no! I would have never put him past maybe fifty-five. Maybe he's 50. my dad's friend. No way! Yeah, that's that's how we know each other. Is um. They served together in the same time period. Mm-hmm. Um, they they were both in the agency in a similar time period, and they were he was friends with my parents, so he was it was one of those hey Sean Greener's coming over, and when I first met him, I was you know in diapers looking up at him, and mm-hmm. he's just you know he's known me my entire life, and uh, you know we've gl- grown closer as time goes on, and now you know he's one of my best friends, but. That's just how life works sometimes. But uh, I'm excited to have him on in the morning. So, folks, if you're up tomorrow, 10 a.m. with Dr. Sean. And thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. I know it was a short one, but I really didn't have a plan. I just wanted to come out and chat and talk and spend some time with you folks. And I know Kip wanted to chat as well. Yeah, I just wanted to, you know, please, please, everybody, go read Psalms. 113 through 118 and know that 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 was being sung those those songs were being sung the whole time that he was on the cross right um ray brock um you asked who was the lady guest this is kip she's our thursday regular she's a very close part of the team and you know she'll ask to come on at other nights especially if i'm just going to be showing up by myself i'd rather have her with me than just sit here and have a conversation with the camera. Um, it's, I struggle with that, honestly. I would rather be able to bounce ideas off of someone and get an immediate response than to make a point and then wait 30 seconds for the chat to respond. It, 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 for some reason, it affects my flow. So uh, I like having guests on. If, if anybody also is interested in coming on the show that really thinks they bring a, a unique perspective, we would love to hear from you. Um, especially if you're an NDE uh, person, if you've actually experienced the near death or had a death experience and came back to, you know, share the story. Uh, that's a topic that really fascinates me. So, but ev- everybody have a wonderful night. Kip, thank you so much for coming out. You are welcome. And I, I hope that we see Watchful soon. All right. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye.